We are live. And everything looks good. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Um, I think I'm posting. I'm definitely posting to the right person. Um, hello, welcome. I uh, know there are probably not uh, too many people on here yet, but that is okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start talking about uh, what I will be discussing today. Um, if you don't know me yet, my name is Trenton Brendel. Um, I'm a graduate student at the University of Arizona Wyant College of Optical Sciences. And um, I am going to be talking to you today about how to work with one of these bad boys, which is a backyard telescope. Um, this particular telescope is a Newtonian reflector. Um, it's got two mirrors in it, which I will show you actually right now, um, if you'd like to see them, which I'm sure you would, because it's very interesting to look at mirrors and telescopes, because they're, they're fun, fun gadgets. That is the back of the telescope. You don't want to see that. You want to see the business end of the telescope. Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, this is a Newtonian reflector, and uh, it has two mirrors. Um, it has a primary mirror, which you can see in the back here. Uh, it's well illuminated by my display. And then it also has a secondary mirror, which sits right here on this spider. Is what this is called. These little metal beams are called a spider, and they hold the secondary mirror. I'm going to change focus so you can actually see that a little better. So you can see I'm now focusing on the image on the primary mirror of the secondary. And uh, if you look really closely there, you can actually see a little target. And we're going to talk more about that target here in a moment. But basically what that target is, is that is the target for how I'm going to collimate this telescope. You can see I just turned on a little light here. This is actually a laser um, that is attached right here to my telescope. And you are seeing the image of the laser on the primary mirror. Um, bounced off of the secondary mirror. Um, and so what we're going to be doing is we're actually going to be using this laser to figure out how to tip and tilt the primary mirror to get that spot to line up directly in the center of this target here. And that is the process of collimation. But before we do that, before I show you how to actually collimate, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a primer on why you would want to collimate a telescope in the first place. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to look at a really amazing telescope that um, I'm sure if you have spent any time in Arizona, you probably know about uh, this telescope. I don't want to run into that. It's okay. We're, we're fine. Um, this telescope is the Large Binocular Telescope. So I'm going to switch screens here really quick. There we go. Um, so, as I mentioned, a Large Binocular Telescope is a um, observatory that exists on Mount Graham um, here in Arizona. And it is um, a wonderful, magnificent uh, telescope. It's actually um, currently the largest the telescope with the largest collecting area in the entire world, which is really exciting if you think about it. Um, the I forget exactly how much. I think it's 125 meters squared. I should have done this calculation before I started this stream. But somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sure somebody in the chat might know, or you can do the calculation really quick in your head or with a numerical calculator. Um, but the primary mirrors of this telescope are 8.4 meters in diameter. And we can see that here in this three-dimensional model. This is a, uh, an LBT, or Large Binocular Telescope, primary mirror. Um, and much like the primary mirror that I have right over my right shoulder, it is involved in taking light from essentially infinity um, or from where the stars are at, but you know, for all intents and purposes, purposes they are at infinity um, in terms of focus. Um, and it takes that light from infinity, bounces it off the primary mirror, which is a reflectively uh, coated piece of O'Hara E6 uh, low CTE glass, or low coefficient of thermal expansion glass. Uh, the primary was actually made right here in the uh, Richard F. Karras Mirror Lab. I used to work there. Um, and it is a magnificent piece of hardware, this primary mirror. Um, this is what it actually looks like in real life. Um, if you look at the LBT in person um, on an observish observation night, uh, this is looking right along the horizon. Um, and you can see 
in the primary mirrors. And notice I'm only showing in the optical models, I'm showing one half of the system. I'm showing uh, what's called the large binocular camera red side. So it's only one half of this uh, binocular camera system. Each of these primary mirrors is 8.4 meters in diameter um, and coded. Obviously, they're quite reflective and they see two different views, but essentially they're seeing nominally the same thing if they're pointed the right direction, which is part of what my research focuses on is making sure that they're pointed where we want them to be. Um, but not only is the pointing important, pointing in terms of where it's looking in space, you can see right now it's looking at the horizon for a calibration setup before an observational run, but um, also the collimation of the system. And when I say collimation, what I'm actually referring to is I'm referring to the ability of an optical system to take light from infinity um, and then spit it out the back end in a beautifully radially symmetric point spread function that has very little energy outside of the central core. This is a logarithmic um, plot, but if I look at a linear plot, which is more akin to what you would actually see if you were to image a star onto a focal plane, you can see you have a beautiful airy disk right here, which is fantastic. That is what we want to see. Um, however, if you do things like perturb the telescope, and so what I'm going to show you here is, um, is a perturbation that I'm applying. I'm actually um, decentering the primary mirror. Uh, which is this this mirror here, big, huge 8.4 meter mirror, same one that's right here. Uh, essentially, I'm looking, let's go to the next tab over. This is a night view, pretty cool. Um, and again, uh, th this building is massive. If you ever get to visit this in person, uh, I would highly recommend uh, taking that opportunity because uh, they might, if you're uh, allowed to go inside the observatory, take you right up next to these mirrors. And it is truly astonishing how massive these mirrors are when you're standing right next to them. Um, you can actually walk on these decks right alongside. Obviously not right now because it's tilted sideways. You'd fall right off to your death. Um, but, you know, if it's tilted upwards, which we'll show here in a sec, um, you can walk on them. This is another view um, along the truss um, support system showing a closer view of the primary mirrors for the red and blue uh, channels. They're color-coded, which is nice. Uh, and when I say uh, the two channels, really I'm referring to these camera systems, the large binocular camera red channel and large binocular camera blue channel. So uh, one of them is red because it observes in the red uh, wave bands. Uh, in this case, if we look at this optical model, the wave bands we're looking at are the 500 nanometer out to a whole micron. Um, so that's like the red end of the visible spectrum. Uh, well, actually starting in the green, going into the red, and then into the near-infrared. Um, and this, this telescope system is optimized um, primarily for this green band. You can actually see right in here, the green band is shown in green here at 0.55. Um, that's like a mercury uh, discharge lamp. Um, is, it has that characteristic uh, view, so if you've ever done any kind of like um, Newton's ring uh, optical testing, you probably know about the nearly 550 nanometer wavelength, but you can see this telescope is um, performing pretty well. I will mention for those uh, more advanced viewers here, all five of you right now, uh, that you'll notice the airy ring for this system is actually only encompassing the very central piece of this system. And if I have a look at the RMS radius, we're looking at an RMS radius of uh, about six microns across, whereas the airy disk is a whole 1.2 microns, which is essentially a sixth a little more than a sixth, about a fifth of that value. Uh, the reason being that you don't actually have to have diffraction limited for every system. You don't have to have, to have a diffraction limited imaging system for this because um, you'll notice I've drawn crosses here on this spot diagram. Each of these quadrants represents one pixel on the large binocular camera approximately. There is actually space between the pixels if you look closer, so it's not quite that, but um, each pixel is approximately 15 microns across. This is 30 microns across, so half of this is 15 microns, one quadrant is 15 microns. So essentially what you're achieving here is that for out to a one micron wavelength you're getting the entire geometric radius, which I mean there's an RMS and geometric radius, which I will not go into because it's more advanced, but you're getting the entire geometric radius imaged on two pixels, which satisfies the Nyquist sampling criterion, which is required for achieving appropriate uh, spatial resolution and uh, sampling, spatial sampling of the uh, points on the image. So you can see this also in the um, spot diagram. If we look at the central core um, of this particular wavelength, this is the 550 nanometer wavelength, we see that it's very nicely imaged onto this 
central beam, which only goes out to, uh, let's say, a couple microns in size. Um, if we increase in wavelength, we get much longer, or much larger PSF characteristics with more rings visible, because we're essentially pushing out of focus at that point. Um, but, you know, uh, we, as mentioned before, we're still Nyquist sampling all the way out to one micron. Uh, the blue system works on shorter wave bands. Um, I forget exactly how low it goes. I think it's down to 250 nanometers, which is like, that's that's not true. It doesn't go down that far. That'd be very difficult to achieve. Um, but back to the point. The point is, um, this large binocular camera is an amazing, amazing instrument that has two different cameras uh, attached to um, the system. Now, um, there's a common misconception uh, that um, all observatories are also telescopes. Now, if you get a little bit nitpicky on that, in order for something to be a telescope system, um, at least in the way that certain people define it, a telescope system allows you to stick your eye right up to the focal plane and then use your eyeball as the imaging lens. Um, you'll notice if um, if you were to uh, stick a mirror on here, say there was a mirror right here instead of a lens and you bounce light back you could actually achieve um, a collimated beam on the outside and this is called the Gregorian mode of focus. I actually don't have a model of the Gregorian mode open which is kind of embarrassing I should but um, you can actually bounce that light um, down through the hole in the primary which you can see in this image right here there's a hole um, and you can actually see a reflection of that mirror right here in the prime. Oh, sorry that's not the mirror that's a uh, test plate I think that might be the Gregorian setup. But yeah, um, on a couple of these views, you can see um, the the mirror being used instead of a camera. Um, in that case, you could essentially stick your eye near the focal point, except it would be blindingly bright because of how much uh, étendue these mirrors pick up, um, because of how big they are. Um, their A omega product is quite large. But um, you could image onto your eye. but as you may know, you cannot do that with the large binocular telescope. You cannot stick your eye in the middle of the beam path and look through the telescope. In any real sense, you have to use a camera to do it or some other sort of detector and sensor. Um, so these uh, cameras actually describe the observatory as being more of a camera than a telescope. So it's an interesting little tidbit, in fact, that you should note. Um, telescopes are not equal to cameras, but most observatories are actually cameras in principle. So these are cameras. We're going to look at the camera uh, set up here. Um, but this telescope that I have over my right shoulder is actually a backyard telescope. I can attach a camera. This camera that you're, you're looking at my face through right now can be attached to this telescope. That is possible to do. But that is not what I'm going to do today because I need that so you can see what I'm going to do here in a moment. Um, so, um, but yes, uh, case in point, these are cameras. You can see here, uh, they're not. This is not a telescope. It is actually a camera system. Um, here you can see a better view. This is actually the uh, the red channel. I think that might be the blue channel um, from the bottom. And you can also see the active prior, active secondary mirror. Um, it's actually a membrane mirror um, that's about I think it's a centimeter thick of glass glass shell that's attached to some uh, voice actuator coils. Um, and this system is used uh, in a Gregorian fashion and or other fashions for um, imaging through the hole in the primary um, or non-imaging applications through the hole in the primary um, and also to bounce light off this tertiary mirror into the uh, large binocular uh, telescope interferometer instrument which is one of the particularly awesome features of uh, the large binocular camera is that it is a binocular system Right, we've got two mirrors that you can see here, one, two, and you can combine light from those two mirrors and achieve about a 25, mi a 25 meter baseline. And the baseline is just a measure of the uh, distance from the central axes, I think central axes, yeah, central axes of these two mirrors. And when you combine the light, that baseline is used um, as you sweep across the night sky to do interferometric observation on um, different uh, stellar objects. Uh, you can learn more about that if you look at the LBT's website. They have all kinds of information on LBTI and Lucy and other instruments that are contained inside of here. Uh, but today we're going to focus more on just what do we do with this thing and how do we make it work correctly. Um, so uh, this is another view you can see of uh, the two uh, camera systems, blue and red channel. 
Um, and um, we are going to now look at what actually happens when a telescope is misaligned. In this case, we're actually going to start with a tilt um, about x in this case. So I'm just going to start tilting. And I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm tilting the primary mirror. Uh, you can see right off the bat that um, the sampling starts to get really wonky. So I'm actually going to go ahead and increase the sampling and increase the sampling some more. And I may have to just reduce the tilt. Uh, and we may just want to actually decenter because uh, the PSF calculation can get very challenging. Oh, I should comment on what PSF is first off. Um, so a PSF or point spread function um, is a essentially a transfer function that describes the transfer of uh, radiation in object space into image space um, in a way that is easier to interpret than something like a modulation transfer function, an MTF, which I'm not going to go into detail about those because I'm not trying to teach you optical design or imaging systems today. I'm trying to teach you about telescopes and backyard telescopes, but I wanted to give you a bigger picture um, of these telescope systems. So um, this PSF, or point spread function, um, describes the spread of a point of irradiance in object space as it enters into image space. And so this point of irradiance that's imaged through the system using either Fourier methods, which in this case we're using Fourier methods, this FFT PSF uses a fast Fourier transform to compute the PSF as it goes through the system. There are plenty of other ways to do this, such as like Huygens integrals, but it takes a lot longer. And I don't have time for that right now. So, but you can see that the on-axis point looks quite different then the off-axis point, we're actually going to use logarithmic uh, scale for both of these, so they look a little bit more similar. Um, but as we do things like tip and tilt the primary mirror or push it out of position in X, you can see that the PSF starts to decenter and we start to lose that bright central core. It's especially easy to see in logarithmic form. Uh, we may crash Optic Studio here and then I'll shift over to looking at the non-sequential model. Um, and that is okay. Um, so let's let that just figure itself out for a sec. Um, I'm going to go over to this non sequential model and keep talking about tips and tilts um, as that's deciding to, to work maybe. Um, so um, as I mentioned, this PSF is a measure of points, say stars, in object space onto the sensor. Well, if your primary mirror is not where you expect it to be relative to the camera system or relative to your eyepiece, which I'll talk about eyepieces here in a moment, or relative to, um, say, your uh, DSLR camera that you have attached to your uh, telescope, then the points are actually going to start to be displaced in space. And that is no good. We do not want our points to be out of place, or our point spread function to be displaced or smeared, because then we're actually going to have reduced imaging performance. So it looks like this is actually frozen. I'm going to force quit this guy and open a new iteration of Optic Studio. This is the beauty of live performance, because uh, live performance never goes as you expect it to. And that is OK. So we're going to close it. I'm going to force quit it, because it doesn't want to close. Um, and I'll keep talking. So, um, is this one? Yeah, it's a non sequential one. That is this one. <clears throat> okay, so uh, you get a look at a beautiful view of uh, the LBT again. But um, when you tip and tilt that primary mirror and or the secondary mirror um, in a telescope system, you cause the point spread function to spread out and blur. Uh, when that happens, uh, your imaging performance degrades and you start to see what are called optical aberrations in the system. Um, now, these optical aberrations um, can reduce your ability to resolve objects in object space. So if you're looking at, say, a binary star system um, that you want to do some astronomy with, say, um, then you need to be really uh, cautious about uh, maintaining collimation and pointing of your telescope system on that binary star system. Because if you start to lose collimation, you lose the ability of that point spread function to produce these nice symmetrical spots. Um, and instead, you start to get um, non-symmetrical spots. I'm actually going to just close one of these so it doesn't freak out so bad because uh, it, was, it overreacted a lot there. Um, you start to get these very non-symmetrical spots. So you can see if we zoom in on a footprint diagram, this is akin to a spot diagram, but a little bit different. Um, at the image plane, we can see these nice uh, radially symmetric spots for the different wavelengths with one micron out at the outer edge and then the narrower wave bands into the inner edge. 
Um, and if we look at this and start to perturb the primary, so I'm just going to scoot the primary to the uh, positive x direction a little bit, um, and we rerun this footprint diagram by unlocking it and rerunning it, we can see, one, nothing changed. Now, why? Well, not really. A little bit changed, but not a lot. So why is that? Well, a footprint diagram doesn't really show us all that much about the imaging performance of the system. However, a point spread function will show us a lot. And so we're going to keep perturbing this system by decentering an X and then running again, PSF. We see a little bit of junk showing up here in the corners, but not that much. So uh, we've, we can deduce from this that uh, decentering the telescope is not necessarily as problematic. But what if I go ahead and I tilt the telescope by a very tiny amount? If I tilt the telescope, I tilt it just a little bit, and then I rerun this PSF. Well, so far nothing's happening. Um, if I keep doing that, I keep tilting, and I run it again, and I keep tilting, and I run it again, you can start to see things are shifting a little bit. I'm going to increase the breadth, the stroke of this tip and tilt, so you can see it a little better. Now we start to see a little bit more and we'll increase a little more, um, tipping by fractions of a degree right now. So it's pretty sensitive to this, but it's not changing too much. We'll keep going a little more. Now I'm going to put in a pretty hefty tilt about uh, a point. Um, and we see that there's some change in the PSF. Now, not that much change. We don't have that much change yet. Um, and the reason being that I think I actually set up these variables incorrectly. Um, let me check to make sure that is the case. Uh, tilt about x, tilt about y. Oh, they're not applying. That's why. Um, let's see, I'm going to exit this and open a new visual optimizer and see if we can get that to work this time. Let's tilt. There we go. Okay, now it's working. It just wasn't actually tilting. That's why there was no change. Um, so, yeah, we're going to have issues with that. But we can actually see on the footprint diagram if we zero this back out at the center. Uh, we have nothing happening, but as soon as we start to tilt about uh, x in this case, tilt about x, um, we'll tilt this way, we can start to see the spots moving, right? These spots on the image plane. These are spots that represent the individual field points that we're tracing through this ray, this, this optical system, rays that we're tracing through the optical system. Um, now, if we go back to the center, as we saw before, and we zoom in on this central field point right here, um, now we should actually start to see a difference. Um, if I go ahead and I start, let's uh, first perturb by decentering about x, you can see the spots start to move and displace. So now we're actually seeing the effect we expect to see. It got so big that it actually moved outside of the field of view. And now we're starting to see some aberrations in the system. You see how there's some curvature showing up in some of these uh, spots. And we're starting to shift away. The, uh, the cores of the energy are not in the same spot that they were. If we look at the PSF, we're starting to see this interesting pattern, um, which uh, would lead one to believe that we might have an aberration called coma. Uh, and that is exactly what we're picking up as we decenter. So we're essentially not using the center of the primary anymore. We're starting to use different portions of the mirror, and we can pick up this huge amount of chromatic aberration, not chromatic, but chromatic, um, as we decenter the primary. Uh, we can do the same if we tip and tilt the primary. Um, I'll go back to a zero center point there, and I'll tip about x. Uh, you can see immediately the PSF starts to lose fidelity. Um, it becomes hard to sample. As soon as you tip and tilt the primary and the mirrors aren't tracing, sorry, the rays aren't tracing uh, nicely, we uh, have a hard time using the PSF analysis features. Uh, I'm just going to turn this all the way up and see if it, oh yeah, I don't even have enough memory on this uh, high powered computing machine. Let's see if we can compute with a lower sampling. Uh, we just need to get one shot. That's all I need. Just one shot. Um, so yeah, as we perturb this primary mirror, you can see very clearly that spots are changing in shape. We're picking up optical aberrations, and our imaging performance is degrading. Uh, I'm actually just going to terminate this one because it is not going to run for us right now. Uh, it's easier to see also on this spot diagram here, which if I go ahead and bring this back to center, and rerun this guy, um, oh, it didn't. It broke the... Uh, Let's go back to this, and I'm going to reopen a visual optimizer, and we're going to close that FFT because it's uh, now become a nuisance. Um, I should have known that my machine was not quite powerful enough yet for that. Um, but yeah, so we're going to um, now tip and tilt the primary by just a small amount and see how the spots change. If 
we tip and tilt, you can see immediately all the spots just run away from us. If I go ahead and I, um, I'm actually going to turn symbols off and I'm going to let the plot scale change. You can see if I let the plot scale change, we're already at 200 microns across here when before we were at 30 microns across. Really extending this spot out um, in the negative x uh, angular direction um, as we're tipping and tilting. And you can see the further we go, um, if this is still going to work for me, uh, which it looks like it's not. It's not. We're Visual Optimizer is a tool that uh, is very, very nitpicky. It doesn't like to work half the time. Um, we'll tilt in the other direction this time. So I'm tilting, and then we're going to run that spot diagram and see, and it's not going to work, and that's okay because the system is just having a having a ball with this FFT here, um, and it doesn't want to just let it die. That's fine. Um, so. Uh, because the optical software is uh, misbehaving, which it often does. This is a very common uh, place for optical software to misbehave when you need it to perform. We're just going to move on to talking about the actual system. So I'm going to flip screens here again. And we're going to talk about a telescope that is in this room with me right now. Great. Before I start, does anybody have any questions in the chat? You're welcome to send them in the chat. I see that there are five of you watching right now and do send questions now so I can answer them when I'm done collimating. I know you came to see the main event, which is the collimation, which is what we're going to do right now. Uh, so, let us collimate a telescope. I need to flip screen so I can see in live what I'm doing. I'm going to focus on that guy. Alright, so now you can see this tool right here uh, is made by Astromania. It is a collimating laser. And what it does, as I uh, briefly explained earlier, is that when I turn it on, um, it uh, will illuminate um, if it's bright enough. I'm actually going to turn off this light right here to make it a little darker in here and easier to see. It will illuminate um, if the battery's not dead, which if it is, that's a real bummer. It is not. It's working just very dimly. It's okay. We don't need much. We just need a little bit. Okay, so if you look in here, um, you can't see it because it's uh, a little dim at the moment, but if I just drop this ISO down... Nope, oh, nope, oh, that's the shutter speed. Drop it down to about there. You can see the red spot in the telescope uh, core bouncing off the primary and the secondary. Or sorry, secondary and primary. So it's coming out of this uh, piece right here, up here. Um, this uh, collimating laser, and then it's uh, heading down through to the secondary, which is attached to the spider, and then down to the primary. And so what we're going to do is once I get this lined up so you can actually see on here, I'm going to make this easier for myself and close the telescope hole, the front hole right here. And I'm also going to put a different lens on because it'll be much easier for you to see if I have a mild telephoto that I can zoom into that spot. Autofocus with that off. And we've got our lens and we're ready to start shooting. Now we're going to zoom right into that bad boy and look right there. That's where we want to look. And we'll focus. Bada bing, bada boom. Now you can see it, I think, except that it's really dim still. But as long as we can see it well enough, that's all we need drop that exposure a little more. Alright, so what we're looking for here is a little red spot on this uh, this target here. We don't need much. Uh, we just need a teeny bit of energy right there and you can see it now. There is a little red dot. Uh, I'm actually going to turn this monitor off temporarily. Um, now it's too dim. You can see it. Not well, but you can see it. Uh, and we'll just turn it up just a tad more. Okay, so there's a red dot on the target. Now the target is essentially pointing at the primary mirror. And the primary mirror is what we want to tip and tilt to get it to point in the right direction. So what I'm going to do is I'm back here at the back of the telescope, I am loosening these locking screws 
that are back here that hold the primary mirror in place once you get it in the right spot. These are essentially it's just a tri uh, trifecta of mounting points. There's three points, one, two, three, on the back of this primary that's in here. Um, and they allow you to uh, rotate them to adjust. You can see as I'm tipping these guys, I can move that little laser spot. And I, what I want to do is I want to take the laser spot that's currently off the center and bring it in towards the center. And we can tip it in on three axes here, or along really two, two axes but with three different contact points. And so I can move these really far off and you can see how the spot changes. It actually changes in shape too and that's essentially a measure of how the PSF is changing with a misaligned primary. Um, and then we can bring this in and we're going to loosen that side up to bring that corner in. And we're going to loosen that side to bring this corner in. And we're going to do a little bit more here to bring that down and bring that down and bring this guy up. It's kind of like, uh, well, if you ever aligned optics on an optical bench, this is pretty much the same process where you've got a three point uh, mirror per se, and you're just tipping and tilting um, along three axes of the mirror. Um, as soon as you see that spot start to go away, um, you're pretty much within the central core of the energy, um, or the central core of the energy for a collimated wavefront or a plane wave coming in is good to go. If I look really close, that looks pretty good. And so, what we can do now is we can go ahead and we can turn this little laser system off. Looks like it actually just ran out of power. How about that? Oh no, it didn't. it's just a. It's not. It's 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 well collimated. That's what happened. So I'll turn it back on. I can shine it right uh, in the camera so you can see briefly if I can get it. To oh, I turned it on. Here we go. Uh, if I shine it in the camera, you can see what it looks like. It's essentially just a laser pointer uh, in here that I'm now pointing at my sensor, uh, which bounces into the telescope system. So now that we've got that done, I'm gonna go ahead and zoom back out to about here. Uh, turn this guy off. Never look straight into lasers, kids and adults. Anyone, don't look straight into a laser. Even if it's eye safe, it can hurt you. It will, if you look into it long enough, blind you. And especially if you have optics on your eyes already like I do. Some of these lenses, which don't actually have, uh, they don't add optical power. So They don't add a substantial amount of optical power. They can still change how you see things in the sense that um, you can still hurt your eyes. So don't look into lasers, don't look directly at the sun. These are things that you should know already, but if you don't know them, then you know them now. Um, so we now have an astronomical telescope, backyard telescope, that is collimated. And so if I stick a target up, such as, say, like a screen we can look at right here, we'll look down at this screen. Um, actually, I'm going to look right back into the camera because that will give us the best possible experience here. Good. So, uh, and also just note, I'm uh, this this mount is partially broken that I have right here, but it does have the ability to roll about this axis and roll about this axis, so I can tip and tilt it and swing it wildly. But that's not what we want to do right now. We want to just look through uh, the primary at what's on the other side of the telescope. So if I focus down on that primary and past it, you can see I'm finding uh, that region there. Um, and if I shine a light into, let's say I'm going to use this light right here, shine a light into the eyepiece, you can see that I can illuminate the primary mirror. So that is essentially what I'm going to call a reverse trace from the eyepiece of the telescope right here, which is what I what I would look through if I were to go outside and I want to look um, at an astronomical object, I would loosen this focus ring right here, pull this guy out just a tad, and then I would uh, maneuver my focus so that I can uh, get appropriate focusing without my glasses on. You can actually use a telescope without glasses because you can just move the focus in and out as needed um, for your vision. Same thing with binoculars, which I have a pair right here, and then I'll explain those in a sec, but I can just move this guy where I need it, and then I can look through this uh, eyepiece right here, um, and if we get it just in the right spot, I actually should be able to see a focused image, yeah, that's pretty close. So you can see essentially a focused image of the light from my camera phone, right here that I'm shining through. This is the same principle. Um, 
as looking through a telescope forward, um, except that I was shining rays backwards through it. So that was kind of like me uh, taking this optical system right here, which you can see if I flip over here, this optical system, and tracing rays rather than from here, tracing them from this imaging plane right here, tracing them from this plane, which this is essentially the eyepiece that we're looking through, out into object space. That's essentially the same idea. So this telescope is now ready to go outside, and I can slew it around with an eyepiece on it and go and look for astronomical objects to look at. So what uh, that might look like, if you want an idea of uh, how we do backyard astronomy, um, is I would find a, a sky object that I want to look at. Something in the sky, say uh, Jupiter and Saturn are pretty close right now, um, so I would maybe want to go look for the moons of Saturn or the moons of Jupiter or the rings of Saturn. You can see them through a telescope like this quite easily, and you can take a photo with your smartphone, which I actually did last spring, um, and I captured the moons of Jupiter, which was really impressive. Uh, I'm an amateur astronomer, so I thought it was Saturn, and I said it was Saturn. And I was wrong. So I'm glad the real astronomers out there came and corrected me. But uh, I digress. The point is, um, this thing is ready to go for tonight when I'm going to go outside in my backyard. And if there are no clouds, which there might be, um, but if there are no clouds or there's a break in the clouds, I can actually uh, use this to do some backyard astronomy and look for cool objects. I can look for comets. I can look for look at uh, the planets. I can look at stars. I can look at galaxies. I can attach my DSLR camera directly to this guy with a tube, an extender tube that I have right here, also made by Astromania, um, that allows me to uh, put the uh, DSLR sensor right onto the imaging plane of uh, this system and so I can uh, do some astrophotography. You can also add eyepieces inside of this dealio if you want. You can just plop them right inside of there um, and or just magnifiers. So for example I have it's called a 2x Barlow. Um, this guy you can stick inside of that uh, telescopic extender um, and then you can look with a two times magnification applied at your eyepiece. So if the focal length of this telescope is, uh, it's on here somewhere. I should know what it is by heart, but I don't. Oh, it's right here. Uh, it's a thousand millimeters, one meter. So the focal length of the telescope is one meter. The focal length is actually determined by the uh, radius of curvature of the primary. The radius is, uh, radius over two is the focal length. So the radius of curvature of this mirror should be 2,000 millimeters or two meters. Um, if I were to take uh, light and bounce it, just collimated beam off of this guy, it would focus light down one meter out in front, which actually turns out to be just about this distance. Just about. We don't want it to be perfectly this distance because we want to be able to take that light, bounce it off the secondary mirror, which is essentially a plane mirror, and then have it come shoot out this way. That's how Newtonian works, so we can put it on the eyepiece and then look through it. But uh, yeah, that is uh, the dealio. This is, uh, we. Some people call it a 10 inch reflector, 10 inch Newtonian. It's actually 200 millimeter Newtonian, so it's not quite 10 inches. 10 inches is actually 25.4 millimeters times 4, so you get an extra 1.6 millimeters, right? Is that right? Yeah, 1.6 millimeters. So it would really be 101.6 millimeters is a 10 inch, but this is, this is 100 millimeter. 200 millimeter. I said that completely wrong. It's 25.4 times 8, so you get an extra 3.2 millimeters. Um, yeah, we have all different kinds of different eyepieces. Um, one of the tricky things about doing astronomy uh, is sometimes it can be very difficult to find your objects. Uh, let's see if we have any questions. Ooh, how often do you need it? Okay, Addie said cute cat. That is true. This is our cat Peach. Um, she is a cutie. She's very meowy, um, and she's not interested in astronomy at all. She's more interested in like uh, looking at birds um, and chasing them and uh, we don't let her inside though so she's never killed a bird don't worry about it she just likes looking at them and pouncing and then running into the glass um, uh, Humo said how often do you need to recalibrate uh, so the frequency uh, of recollimation for a telescope really depends on how you use it um, if you swing it around all the time and you're doing a lot of perturbations to the system um, and or you're taking it on and off of the mount often, you're going to have to recollimate it more often. Um, but, uh, you know, 
if you don't swing it around that much, then you probably won't have to recollimate very frequently at all. If you put these locking rings down, which I actually didn't tighten these down because I'm going to uh, put a new battery in my collimating laser and recollimate with a little bit larger spot later um, so that I can get a better um, better collimation um, by also moving the laser back. You can do that. I didn't do that in this case, but you can. You Since you're increasing the length of your measurement arm when you move this laser source back, which was here but is not here anymore. Um, but yeah, basically to answer your question, um, how often you need to recollimate is very much a, feat a factor of uh, the um, how hard you are on your telescope and how often you use it. This hasn't been used yet in a while. It's been, it was used last spring, but I haven't used it since I moved into this new house. I also just pushed the primary, so it's definitely uncollimated right now. So I'm going to fix it again. But you can see it's pretty quick. Once you have the right tools to do it, you can also just make your own collimating system um, if you're willing to cut out a little target and put a laser pointer through it. But you want to make sure uh, that it's pretty well centered um, because if you have slight deviations, you can have poor imaging and stars. Instead of looking like spots with rings around them, they'll start to look more like the chromatic images we saw earlier, um, which are not desirable, especially if you're trying to make beautiful images. Um, but yes, the rings of Saturn made me a major astronomy. Yes, thank you. Yes, we, we do appreciate your expertise in the rings of Saturn. Um, let's see what else. Do oh yeah, so I was going to talk a little bit about how we actually find objects in the night sky. So as I'm slewing this telescope around in the night sky, I'm swinging it around three dimensions, essentially along two axes, but they correlate with one another, so it's really three-dimensional rotations that I can do. Um, you want to make sure these weights are in a nice spot um, so that it's well balanced. Right now it's actually not well balanced because I didn't take time to balance it uh, correctly. Um, but if you were to do this the correct way, you would move these weights up and down. I can actually just show you essentially how that's done right now. So you'd move the weights up and down so that when you rotate like this, it has almost no uh, friction. I actually did a pretty good job. Often you'll separate these a little bit, but you can also just put them together. These are each 10, 15 kilos? No, they're not that much. They're either 5 or 10 kilograms, which I they could also just be 10 pound weights, but they allow you to counterbalance the telescope, which makes it easier for the telescope to roll on its bearings. Um, you can use the equatorial mount feature. There's actually an optical system right down here. Uh, it is a, its own little telescope. Um, then if you look through it, you can actually see there are lenses in here. Um, I can't really show you because I'd have to remove the camera and it could lose its connection. So, But just trust me, there are lenses in here. Um, I can prove it to you actually if I just turn on a light right here and shine it down this hole and stick my hand down here. You can actually see uh, that there is actually text written in there also. I didn't know there was text written in there. That's cool. It's written on the edges of the telescope. Uh, oh, I'm looking at the labels on the side. That's cool. Yeah, so you can use this. If you point this towards the north, there's actually a little uh, logo on the mount here. It says N for north. Um, then you can uh, do some nice alignments, uh, equatorial or polar alignments, um, which allow you to track across the night sky really nicely. If this is aligned to the north, um, you can essentially just uh, slew the telescope across the night sky as it rotates. That's a little bit more advanced than my understanding of how to use this mount because it is partially broken. Um, but you can do that. Also, one of the easiest ways to do this is actually uh, with an app or star chart. I use Starwalk 2 um, or Skywatcher. There's a couple apps you can use. Um, they're all great. But uh, yeah, you can find astronomical objects. Um, I also just realized this logo is right in front of my face, so I'm just going to stand right up here. You can find astronomical objects um, by looking at your smartphone and pointing it up at the sky and turning on the gyroscope features and you can figure out where things are. Um, and once you get a rough idea of where they are, um, you can use what's called a spotting scope. This scope right here that I'm going to point towards you is a spotting scope. Flip views so I can see this live. Um, this spotting scope which I can look through and get a nice look. You can see my eye through that, maybe? Yep, yep, you can see it right there. There's my eye. Um, this spotting scope once aligned to the telescope system, which can be done with a laser, if you put a laser right along the base. Um, and then you can also put a laser through here. Uh, 
including your laser you use for collimation. Um, and once these are aligned, the optical axes of the telescope and the optical axes of the spotting scope, you can use this wide angle spotting scope to look. You can actually see if you look closely through it, it has a crosshair, crosshair, kind of like a rifle scope. Uh, you probably can't see it actually on this view, but yeah, it has a crosshair um, inside of it uh, that allows you to line up different star targets um, in the night sky or galaxies or whatever you want to look at. Um, that's very useful. Um, this thing is pretty fun to take apart. It's a very simple system made of really cheap glass and it has some beautiful chromatic dispersion. Um, you can also just use a pair of binoculars. Uh, this is a pair of uh, Celestron binoculars that are in pretty poor shape. They're not collimated, speaking of collimation. Um, and so one of the halves of the, well I should say the line of sight is off. So the line of sight for this uh, binocular system is not quite perfect and so one of your eyes has to look one direction and one eye has to look the other direction. This is not optimal performance. Um, I need to recollimate this but that means I have to take off some of the outer bits and adjust some things. Um, and I want to do it on an optical bench, but uh, it's not super safe to do that right now uh, because of COVID. So, yeah, you can also use uh, binoculars and figure out where things are, generally speaking. Also great for bird watching. Um, if you're into that kind of thing, I know my cat is, so, you know. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of different eyepieces you can put on a telescope, too. Right now I have a wide-angle eyepiece on it. So um, it's a generally a pretty wide field of view. I think it's a 10, 25, 25 millimeter focal length. Uh, if you take the focal length of the primary and the secondary and you multiply them, um, you can figure out things about the magnifying power of a telescope system. Um, I should know this off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure if you just multiply them directly and then take the inverse. Oh man, Dr. Graven Camp is gonna be so disappointed they should not let me pass the prelim exam because I don't remember this. Um, but I did know it a couple weeks ago and then I proceeded to forget everything I learned for that preliminary exam. <laughs> so, yeah, basically, uh, you sh you would be able to figure out the, f the effective field of view, you'd be able to figure out the magnifying power, and so you could say, oh, this telescope is currently working at 100x, um, which essentially is just like the visual magnification of a system where your eye, if you were just looking directly at it, would be one times the size of what you could see if you were looking through a telescope. It's a resolution criterion measure. Um, and I think that's about all I want to say. Um, if there are no more questions in the chat, uh, I'll wait for a couple seconds for this to catch up. Um, then I think I will conclude. This is a rather lengthy outreach event we've done here because I rambled a lot and technology failed to work at times. But you all stuck it out with me for the long haul all of y'all thank you for joining me this has been a blast um get yourself a telescope i bought this bad boy for 300 bucks off facebook marketplace when i moved out here brand new it's uh it's like an eight thousand dollar telescope i think with all the stuff that came with it no it's not that's not true it's like two thousand dollar telescope i like but nonetheless um you should get yourself a telescope you should use it you should also just use a pair of binoculars if this is all you can afford is one of these guys then get yourself a nice 50 millimeter entrance pupil diameter. Eight, I think these are 8x. It should say somewhere on here. Oh no, I rubbed the logo off. So uh, I don't actually know anymore what these are, but it doesn't really matter. I think they're uh, 50 by 8x. Um, 50 millimeter entrance pupil, essentially like two inch, two inch entrance for each side, and 8x magnifying power, visual magnification. And you can see things with these, or this. That is all, folks. Have a great rest of your day. Go do some astronomy this weekend. Bye.